Yes, um, can you start the YouTube for us? Yeah, we, we are live now. Great. Uh, Bruno, take it away. So welcome everyone again to our third and last session of the SEBI Talk series um, for this pilot. Uh, SEBI Talks is, is a series of short, powerful talks that has expand horizons. And this event is hosted by, by SEB and by Instituto Caminho do Meio. Um, for those of, of you who don't know, SEB is a network of Buddhist centers in Brazil oriented by Lama Fatma Santan, which includes over a dozen of urban centers and nine rural communities and retreat centers. And Instituto Caminho do Meio is uh, the nonprofit organization uh, sustained by this, the same network of uh, Buddhist centers focusing on different aspects of social action, education, health, agroecology, giving voice to indigenous people and communication, mm -hmm. communication to transform the world. So I will give the word to Andres Hernandez who is uh, facilitating the session today. Great, thank you, Bruno. Well, we are so excited to have Sensei David Loy with us today. And uh, I'll introduce him a little better in just a few moments. But he's coming to us from Colorado in the US and where he was recently surrounded by the fires, but luckily uh, um, both his center and his, and his house was okay. And it sounds like his community was okay. So we're, we're really glad to hear that. But uh, um, before we get in, uh, uh, Bruno, thank you that uh, this is our third and final of our first series of SEBI talks which are short, powerful talks that expand horizons. And the basic theme is Buddhism and social action. And the theme of our first series has been um, interconnection, community, and global transformation. And so really, David, I think, has the tools, both the practice and the conceptual tools. I think he's really going to help us um, close up our, our, three, uh, our three talk session with some, uh, with some wonderful tools of how we can think more systemically and at a wider level. And before I introduce David, uh, I, want to, uh, I just want to thank a few people because it takes so many people to make a, what appears to be a simple event happen. This looks like a simple Zoom event, but uh, so many people are involved. And um, you know, certainly we have Johnny Vili who is doing our simultaneous translation, which is an enormous job and responsibility. And so we're so thankful for her. So uh, please join me in uh, thanking Johnny for uh, helping us with this. And uh, also we have Lucas Arcangel, who is uh, really being able to kind of uh, well, the whole, the whole techno technological foundation. We have uh, maybe a hundred or so people here on Zoom, but there's many, many more on YouTube and that's all Lucas, so thank you, Lucas. And we have Polly Zock and Leah Beltrone from Bodhisattva Magazine, who have done so much in promoting, so much in, uh, in writing and just making things happen and, and, and just sewing all the points together. And uh, we have uh, Bruno Lasturina, who already spoke, who's been super important in just making a lot of connections happen. And then, of course, um, we're so thankful for Lama Padma Santam for his presence here and, uh, and also for his inspiration and energy in, in making this event possible. So thank you, Lama Santam. So David Loy um, has been writing books for a long time. And I'm so embarrassed, I only recently discovered his work through Bruno actually. And my life would probably be different that I discovered his work uh, 10 or 15 years ago. I think probably better, but uh, you know, we, we can't know. And so uh, David Loy is a, is a Zen teacher in the Sanbo tradition of Zen. He's the director of the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Center. Um, he's a social theorist and philosopher and also a long-term activist beginning with civil rights, and then today working with groups like the Zen Peacemaker Order and Extinction Rebellion. Um, David is a leading figure in bringing the Buddhist concept of emptiness and looking at the resonance with Western concepts of emptiness, but bringing this concept of emptiness to the center of social, political, and historical analysis. And uh, at least in my view, I think that's one of uh, David's uh, huge contributions to both uh, Buddhism as well as the social theory and social action. And he's the author of many books, 
And I can't list them all off, but I'll tell you three of my favorites. That uh, A Buddhist History of the West, where he uses emptiness to look at the history of the West. The World is Made of Stories, a stunning small book and very, very accessible, so one I, I highly recommend. And then his most recent work, which has everything to do with the practice at SEBI, uh, Ecodharma, Buddhist Teachings for the Ecological Crisis. And we just learned that his most recent book has uh, been recently translated into Spanish. So if English is not your cup of tea, so to speak, um, it's available in Spanish. Um, I'm sure that uh, one can find it. And um, also we have hope that uh, maybe in the not too distant future that uh, we might uh, see some translations in Portuguese. So we'll, we'll have to see about that, but for now, uh, not yet. So with that, um, David, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, give you the stage, so to speak, and uh, please take it away with your talk for today. And I can't believe I've, I've suddenly blanked on the title, um, Global, no, Global Crises and New Spiritual Paths. Is that right? C correct me, this is horrible. World Crisis, so that's close enough. Okay, World Crisis and, and New Spiritual, spiritual Paths. Path. Right. Okay, well, I'll let him say the title, my apologies. And uh, so please take it away, David. Mm. Thank you, Andreas. Um, I think, oh, sorry about that. I'm, I'm trying to work out the time. For me to limit it to 20 minutes is gonna be a bit of a challenge. So I, I've, I've got to set it up for myself here. <laughs> I forgot about the bells. Anyway, I wanna start by thanking Andreas. He was thanking everyone else. I think somebody should thank him in my case both uh, for that introduction and especially for um, uh, this opportunity to talk about something that I think is so extremely important these days. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about world crisis, right? Um, Noam Chomsky, the political critic, uh, recently said that in his opinion, this is the most dangerous time in human history. And indeed, it's difficult to think of a more dangerous time. Um, it seems quite ironic that just as humanity has finally achieved a truly global civilization, it seems to be self-destructing. Um, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time listing all the things. I mean, today we're obviously very preoccupied with the coronavirus, but the backdrop of all of that, of course, well, a number of backdrops, but in particular, uh, the ecological crisis. And please note that I don't talk about the climate crisis because for me, urgent though that is, and it's certainly an emergency, that is just a, a symptom, or I guess the tip of the iceberg for a much larger ecological crisis, which includes uh, the sixth great extinction event, the fact that so many plant and animal species are disappearing so quickly, but also many other things, uh, erosion of topsoil. I mean, I know in Brazil, you're having issues with the Amazon. So much of that is being cut down and burned these days. But also so many toxins in the air and the water and the earth in our bodies, plastics and so forth. We could go on indefinitely, but Clearly, this is a very special time, and therefore, it's a very special time for our Buddhist traditions, for our spiritual traditions generally. Uh, how can they help us here? One of my favorite Zen dialogues, very short, the, the uh, student asks the master, uh, what should we do when difficult times come? And the master, this is kind of hard to show on Zoom, the master says, welcome. Our path is not about avoiding difficult times. In fact, these are often the times when we develop and grow spiritually the most. Um, another Zen story that I think is very appropriate here, um, a student asked the master, uh, what's the fruit of a lifetime of practice? And the master answers, uh, responding appropriately. Hmm? Our path isn't about transcending or escaping this world. Rather, what we need to transcend is our egos, to realize our non-duality, our non-separation, to realize that my well-being is not separate from your well-being. And so the question is, given the 
various crises, challenges that we face today, how can the Buddhist and other spiritual traditions help us understand and respond appropriately? So that's the task. The, it seems to me, looking at the Buddhist tradition in particular, it seems to me that the most important thing that Buddhism has to offer is the Bodhisattva path, or as I'm going to try to describe it, the new Bodhisattva path, because I think we need to understand it in some new ways that weren't so relevant in the time of the Buddha, right? Uh, and so I'll explain what I mean by, by the new aspects in a moment, but what I really wanna do in the brief time that I have is to really talk about three aspects of this Bodhisattva path that sort of stand out or seem to me the most important. The first one is simply that bodhisattvas have a double path, right? You can call it a double-sided practice, perhaps like the two sides of a coin. In other words, we continue to work on our own meditation practice or whatever our spiritual practice may be, but we know that that's not sufficient, that it's important for us also to embody what we learn in that practice in terms of how we engage with the world and with other people in the world. Franz Kafka, the, um, the writer wrote, <laughs> Czech writer, Jewish Czech writer. Anyway, he wrote in a letter, you can hold yourself back from the sufferings of the world. That's something you can do, but perhaps this holding back is the one suffering that you could avoid. I'm reminded of the Neo-Vedantin teacher Nisargadatta uh, who, who, who expressed this challenge so clearly, this relationship, when, when he said, when I look inside and see that I am nothing, that's wisdom. When I look outside and see that I am everything, that's love between these two, my life flows, right? I mean, he's really pointing to the two pillars of the Buddhist tradition, and indeed I would say any genuine spiritual tradition, wisdom and love, or as we say in Buddhism, wisdom and compassion, right? Love in this case, compassion, it's not a feeling, but it's a way of being in the world. The reason that it's so important, that it's, I think, necessary to emphasize this double-sided practice is because so often we've understood engagement in the world as a distraction from the real practice. I think many times we have a kind of romanticized idea that we might sort of hide out in a cage, a cave, and sort of meditate by ourselves and then go all the way to Buddhahood like Milarepa and only then maybe come out and decide to help people. I think, in fact, there's a danger to that way of understanding. As Joanna Macy has put it, the world has a role to play in our awakening. Hmm? That we need to, well, how can I say it? Um, when we come to Buddhist practice, it's usually because there's something wrong with our lives, some dukkha, as we say, some dissatisfaction. And so inevitably at the beginning, there's a kind of self-preoccupation trying to understand why we're unhappy, how we're making ourselves unhappy. But as we get more deeply into the practice, what we realize is that in fact, it's the very sense of separation, the delusion that I'm somehow in here and all of you and the rest of the world is outside, that's at the root, at the core of our dukkha dissatisfaction. And if that's the case, then awakening isn't simply a matter of having some insight into the way things actually are, but there is this challenge of embodying that insight into how we actually live in the world. Just because we have insights, it doesn't mean that our usual self-preoccupied habits disappear, no way. Actually, in order to transform ourselves fully, we need to create new habits, habits of engagement, habits of relationship. And that's why, ironically, to actually be involved in, to, that's why to do this double practice, not just focusing on meditation, but also bringing what we realize out into the world in the way we engage with other people. That's why that 
in that double practice, ironically, the one who benefits the most from it is we ourselves, those in trying to embody the bodhisattva ideal, right? So that's the first point, this importance of a double-sided practice. Uh, I remember, um, who was it? Robert Thurman used to say, practice, practice, everyone's always talking about practice. What I really wanna know is, when is the performance? And basically what I'm talking about today is the performance, the engagement, that we can understand that as an essential part of our practice, of our self-transformation as well. That's the first point. Second point of the three that I wanna talk about, uh, and this is where I would say it's, it's a new bodhisattva path, because I think we have a deeper and better understanding of dukkha today. Uh, what I mean by that, the way the Buddhist tradition has developed, um, when we go back to the very earliest of the teachings, uh, the Pali Canon, it's pretty clear, frankly, that the Buddha was a lot more progressive than the Buddhist institution that developed after he died. What I mean by that is, uh, when you look at the Buddha's attitude toward women, the fact that he created a bhikkhuni sangha for them, when you look at his attitude toward caste, the way that when you joined the Buddhist order, you lost all caste, you weren't even really supposed to talk about it. It suggests that he understood the, the dukkha, the dissatisfaction, the social problems built into that, uh, those systems, uh, the patriarchy and the caste system of his day. Um, but what happened after he died is patriarchy and caste and certainly relationship subordination to the kings and rulers, that, those reasserted themselves. Uh, and it may well be that Buddhism survived and thrived because it had to come to an accommodation with the kings, uh, not to threaten them. And so Buddhism emphasized historically individual dukkha, individual suffering. The problems of my life are due to the way my own mind works, due to the way my own karma from past lifetimes is coming back. So the way Buddhism has developed in Asia is that the dukkha has so much understood on an individual level. If you have a problem, it's due to yourself. Don't blame anyone else. And therefore there hasn't been this appreciation of what you might call institutionalized dukkha, the dukkha caused by unjust social structures. And this applies particularly to the three poisons. Um, you know, Buddhism doesn't really talk about good versus evil. It's more, uh, the Buddha rather talked about the three poisons or sometimes called the three fires, uh, greed, ill will, and delusion. And basically the idea is that when we are motivated by these, it's gonna create problems. It's gonna create bad karma, right? I think the really important realization, the addition, the, the amplification of the path today is it's really important to see how these three poisons have become institutionalized, right? For example, if greed means you never have enough, I think that's a pretty good description of sort of corporate consumer capitalism, which always has to keep growing if it's not gonna collapse, right? Consumers need to consume more, corporations need to grow, more profit, higher stock prices. Seems like every government is preoccupied with this GNP, gross national product. Uh, but why is more and more always better if it can never be enough, especially on an earth where the earth doesn't grow, the corporations need to grow. Right, the neoliberal economic order needs to keep growing if it's going to collapse, but the Earth isn't growing. So sooner or later, there's going to be a a a, a squeeze between those two. And frankly, I think it's happening now. I think that's the fundamental problem we're we're facing now, called the ecological crisis. That's institutionalized greed, institutionalized ill will. Well, I'm coming to you from the United States, which frankly, if it's measured in dollar terms, we are by far the most militarized society in human history, given the incredible amount of our national resources that you, we put into it. 
And of course, there are certain things that go along with that. If you're gonna spend so much money on a military, you've got to keep finding enemies. You've got to keep having wars and bombing campaigns, right? You've got to justify that incredible amount of money. But of course, the US isn't the only place that has this problem with militarism. And we can talk about other types of um, what you might call tribal ill will, certainly. Uh, this is a very deep tendency within us to sort of us to, to form groups that define themselves in relationship in opposition to other groups. And then finally, collective delusion. Well, today we're all too familiar, I'm afraid, with what's called um, fake news, but even before that. Certainly in this country, in the United States, almost all the media are private, that is to say corporate, and that is to say they're preoccupied with making money. And they don't make money by educating or informing us, they make money by finding ways to grab our eyeballs and sell them to the highest bidder, advertising. So the idea is to keep us on that treadmill of always needing more and more that it's the next thing we need to buy that's gonna make us happy, right? The reason I mention all three of these institutionalized poisons is I think it's really important for us to realize today that it's not enough simply to work on the individual level. It's not enough simply for you and me to work on our own personal greed, ill will, delusion, but we have to acknowledge that these institutionalized versions of greed, ill will, delusion are also causing enormous suffering. And we have to come together, we have to work together, find ways to challenge these, to transform these as well, or the future will be very grim indeed. So that's the second point. Let me just conclude by saying a little bit about the third aspect of the Bodhisattva path that stands out so much for me. And it's simply this, that the Bodhisattva path, the new Bodhisattva path, it doesn't tell us what to do. Rather, it tells us a lot about how to do what it is that we decide to do. What I mean by that is, you know, let's remember the Buddha, Buddhism began in Iron Age India some 2,400 years ago. And the kind of problems we have today, those weren't the problems that the Buddha was have facing. Uh, I mean, we can go back and read the earliest texts, the Buddhist sutras and so forth. We're not gonna find answers. They're not gonna tell us specifically what to do in the face of ecological crisis or neoliberal corporate capitalism. We, we're just not gonna be able to read those off from the tradition. And so a variety of things are needed to be done and we need to decide for ourselves how to do them. But the, Bod the Bodhisattva path, if you look at it in some detail, the way it talks about different attributes of the Bodhisattva, it has a lot to say. It gives us a lot of information about how to do that how to do whatever it is that we decide to do. And I'd like to conclude by focusing on one of those aspects in particular, which really stands out for me. Uh, in fact, I would, I consider it to be the most distinctive and powerful aspect of spiritual activism in general, which is to say that bodhisattvas act without attachment to the results of their actions. Let me say that again. Bodhisattvas act without attachment to the results, which is something we can do because we're grounded in this meditative, this personal practice, right? In fact, the Buddha himself said that awakened beings, awakened people, the actions, their actions are nidasa, which literally means without expectation. Um, Interestingly, of course, this isn't only a Buddhist attribute, right? Those of you familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, the, the most important text uh, for Hindus. It actually says something very similar. It talks about different paths to God. One of them is meditation, another spirituality, devotion, but it talks about what's called karma yoga. That is to say the path of action, the path of work, the path of engagement. And it emphasizes your right is to the work, never to the fruits. It's saying very much the same thing. It's important to act without attachment to results. Unfortunately, it's also very easy to misunderstand that, especially given that Buddhism emphasizes so much motivation, our intention. It's easy to think, 
oh, you know, whether or not what I do has any results at all, that's not important. What's important is the purity of my intention. If that's our mis if that's our understanding, I would call it our misunderstanding. I think it's very dangerous because uh, that I think really misses the essential point that's being emphasized here. Um, rather, the, the the bodhisattva path is a new way of being in the world, a new meaning orientation. Instead of our usual self preoccupation, you know, what's in it for me, it's kind of turning that around and asking. Uh, what can I do to make the world a better place for all of us? And therefore, it, it, the idea isn't that you act in order to achieve a certain result, but with this fundamental reorientation, that one does that indefinitely. Uh, it, whether one is successful or not, this is the reorientation. Those of you familiar with the Zen tradition, you know, we take the Bodhisattva vow, which says basically, um, living beings are numberless, I vow to save them all. In other words, we take a vow to do something that can't possibly be achieved, but that misses the point. It's not the achieving the goal, rather it's the reorientation of the meaning of, of it all. I'm not talking here about being optimistic or even hopeful in the usual sense. Optimism, pessimism, hopeful, despairing, those are dualistic ways of thinking. And the bodhisattva is motivated by something deeper than that. A compassionate generosity of spirit that wants to express itself and although it seeks results, it doesn't require them. I'm reminded of Vaclav Havel, his redefinition of hope. He said, it's not the conviction something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing regardless of how it turns out. And there's also a, an American writer, Wendell Berry, who really put it well when he said, we don't have the right to ask whether we're gonna succeed or not. The only question we have the right to ask is, what is the right thing to do? What does this earth require of us if we want to continue to live on it? In other words, what this is pointing to is the following orientation. Our task as spiritual activists, as bodhisattvas, as ecosattvas, our task is to do the very best we can, not knowing if anything we do is gonna make any difference whatsoever. Let me say that again, because I think that's the most important thing I can say today. Our job is to do the best we can without knowing whether what we do is gonna make any difference. We can't know, we don't know if what we do is important, but it's important for us to do it. Have we already passed ecological tipping points and maybe civilization as we know it is doomed? We don't know, that's an important aspect emphasized in Zen, not knowing mind. We don't know, but that's okay. Of course, we hope our efforts will bear fruit. We try to be strategic. And yet, here's the fundamental point. Whatever we do, it's our gift to the earth. And like every genuine gift, you don't give a gift because you expect something in return. It's given freely. Now, of course, to act in that way without attachment to results, let's be honest, I think that's a big challenge to all of us and it's gonna be hard to avoid some discouragement, but that's okay. Our job isn't to be perfect, it's to do the best we can. And the whole point of the meditation practice is to enable us not to get stuck there when we do get discouraged, right? Maybe none of us is able to embody this double practice of the bodhisattva perfectly, but that's okay. What does seem to me is that if contemporary Buddhism, if contemporary Buddhists don't want to follow this bodhisattva path, then maybe Buddhism isn't what the world needs by now. But on the contrary, I think that Buddhism, this understanding of the bodhisattva path is exactly what is needed in order to help us respond to as Chomsky puts it, the greatest challenges that humanity has ever faced. So 
and it's going to challenge us to our utmost. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. Yeah. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, David. Please join me if you'd like with a digital reaction, hand clapping, whatever you like. So thank you so much. <laughs> Wait, I, I can clap here. I'll, there you go. <laughs> so great. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little speechless. I'm sorry, but uh, let's let's move it along. That. Uh, it's my pleasure now to invite Lama Santem to, uh, to join and to be the, uh, the host to ask David some questions and hopefully get some good conversation going. And many of us here are, are well familiar with Lama Santem, but I know some people aren't, that uh, Lama Santem is the uh, director of the SEBI communities, a long, long-term environmentalist in Brazil, and some would say a very pivotal um, member of the environmental movement historically. And maybe a lot of people know that he practiced Zen for uh, several decades before uh, going another direction and was also a professor of physics at the Federal University of Yoga Ranger de Sol. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Lama Santan. Please take it away. Uh, you're, you're on silence at the moment. You're muted. Yes. I think I would prefer to to keep <laughs> hearing <laughs> David because it was wonderful, really. Um, I think that uh, we we agree in everything you you said, David. I think uh, we need a, a new way, really, where uh, if you understand what Buddha uh, did, we have to understand that he. Um, tried to help the people of that time under that conditions. Now have other conditions. Then we have to, if we want to copy the Buddha, we have to to try to bring answers and help us and other people in what we're living now. That's that. And uh, I, I, I like very much when we uh, uh, and, uh, we, when we talk about uh, Chomsky and the other references, I, I think it's great. And uh, <clears throat> we do something as we can here, as we can understand what to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point that we realized when we, we uh, seated in the, our center in Viamon, that place, uh, shortly um, we had an invasion in an area an, an area around us, not uh, connect with us, but uh, a group of poor people inv invaded uh, an area. Then we, we have to, to work with social items immediately. They are neighbors to us mm -hmm. and they are fragile. They have to be helped in some sense. Then we have to develop a, a way of doing this. And um, I think it's very important. Uh, also, the Indians, uh, we, we, we found them, they found us, and we are discussing the, the situation of them. And we have to understand what they think. And it, it brought a lot of, uh, um, it brought a, a way of widening our way of looking at things. We have to, to understand them in their, con in their context and they're very different for what we think. I remember um, uh, one of the chiefs, Indian chiefs, saying uh, a, bit, uh, a bit bitter. He was a bit uh, uh, in, uh, wrathful. He said, uh, I don't understand when we talk about protecting nature. I am nature protecting myself or itself <laughs> you know it's very interesting because we, we we talk about nature as a separate thing of us and we think it's very wonderful when we fight for the nature you know but we are not we don't feel ourselves inside that inside that position um, sometimes I, I i feel some criticism because just this what you said 
the Buddha talked about the, the individual problems, not the collective problems, really, not social problems, because it's called in some sense samsara. It is samsara. But the point is that we can learn, we can practice directly with the social problems. Uh, I, am, I am wondering all the time this, and not uh, social problems like uh, uh, human problems, but also social, social problems as I can contemplate, I can look in the nature. For example, I think that the mind, I'm uh, wondering this, I, I feel the mind is something wide or short as we construct this. For example, uh, uh, the social, uh, uh, this, the social consciousness is the mind. As you said, we, we can we can have the three poisons in in a, in a, in a, in a social uh, behavior. Of course, uh, it's uh, it's very important to understand this because we can use exactly dharma for these questions. It's the same thing as an individual or as, as a group. For me, uh, a very important point is how to help uh, a group of people look in a wider way, in a clever way, uh, a more, in a more uh, use more wisdom to look at the things. How can see this? And uh, we can see, for example, that if they uh, they can uh, they can look at the situation they are living in a, uh, with a, a wider time look in the past and look in the future it's a way of bringing some some uh, widening the vision the same when we uh, we look at the situation in a geographic way in a more wide geographic way also and uh, if we learn what the history teach the, to the people before us, or what the, the history can teach us today. Uh, and then in this way, we can think that uh, the social Buddhist way is something that uh, uh, will bring, uh, 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 I don't know what's the good word for this but uh, i mean that we have to be more sage bring more wisdom to to see a wider wisdom to see the things and we, we can uh, uh, perhaps look at all the way of buddha a way of widening the uh, the way of looking at everything till the point that we can see uh, non-duality and we can see, for example, uh, the nature of uh, a timeless nature, uh, 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 non-local nature of the mind that is beyond dead, beyond uh, birth and death. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But we can, uh, we can uh, uh, find in individual questions or in social questions the same uh, path. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when we, we look at the, the nature and we see, for example, the ants, the, the, uh, the bees and the other beings in this middle moment, they are organizing themselves. They, they have a, a common mind. They have a collective mind that can take decisions. They take decisions. It's wonderful. They create uh, realities as we create realities. They create realities collectively. It's wonderful to see. Mm. And uh, it's a, a path. Then I, I think I can understand when we say this. Uh, I think it's a, a, a good way of behaving today and practicing and looking and understanding the thing. And uh, sometime, for example, now, I think how could Trump got seven million, 70 million <laughs> Vote. I cannot understand, my, but maybe you can explain this <laughs> in some way. <laughs> because how can the, the collective mind go uh, 
uh, go uh, not forward but backwards. How how it can happen? You know, how can the the short mind um, take the people? And how can, can the people think that the short mind, the responsive mind, the the violence is a good idea? You know? When I see the people with uh, with guns, heavy guns, uh, going to the to the polls to the the the, the elections, I think it's something is wrong. Something is is uh, it's a kind of problem, really. A problem. And I would of like to hear. I'd like to hear what to do. <laughs> we have in Brazil. We have the same problem. You know, how would the Buddha? do the things. Um, uh, uh, shortly, uh, uh, recently, His Holiness Dalai Lama said, Buddha would be a green person. I, I, I think it's a good thing. And then suddenly the green uh, consciousness is the consciousness for this time. Mm. I, I, I think it's a good thing. It's a very Buddhist because uh, the life, all life, is Buddha expression, uh, Buddha's mind expression, and uh, maybe it have some of a radical approach that connects Buddhism with social things and the individual things also. One one thing I I didn't have time to talk about, but yes. it seems to me very important is what I see as as a fascinating parallel. You know, yes. It's like on the individual level, we have this mm -hmm. sense of separation, this sense of duality that I'm in here and you and other people are outside. Sorry. So we have this <laughs> sense of separation. You are uh, a Zen person, you know, always <laughs> the bell. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what strikes me is the, the fact that it's the same problem in relationship to the earth, you know? We have a collective yes. sense of self that feels separate from the rest of the biosphere, that feels separate mm -hmm. from the earth. And because we feel separate from it, we think our well being is separate from it, that we can use it in any way we want to satisfy our desires. And really, the ecological crisis is, I think, a response to this delusion of separation. But it's the same thing yeah. that Buddha was talking about. It's the same thing that Buddhism mm -hmm. has been talking about on a larger scale. If we have the delusion of separation and we act thinking that we're separate, we don't have to care, then lots of deep problems occur. And that's exactly what's happening now. Yeah. Yes. I think we're very fortunate that um, f from the very beginning, Buddhism has emphasized impermanence and insubstantiality. And this applies to the Buddhist tradition as well. So, you know, the kind of concerns that we both have about institutionalized greed and so forth. Although we don't find this in the original sutras, it grows organically or naturally out of what the Buddha had to say mm -hmm. applied to our situation. So Buddhism too is impermanent. Buddhism too is insubstantial yeah. in the sense yeah. that it can and really it has to change to transform in order to continue to be the most liberative for us today in this time. And so in a, when we talk about the eco-dharma or the eco-sattva path, I think this is the natural development of the dharma in our time in response mm -hmm. to the kinds of crises that we're, that we're facing today. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think we agree in everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure for us to hear you. Yeah. You know, I don't know what to do. Maybe you have good ideas also what to do. <laughs> I, think, I think a variety of things are needed, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Like even within my circle here of Ecodharma people in Boulder, you know, there are some uh -huh. people working in Congress. There mm -hmm. are other people helping people individually, uh, individual carbon footprint, you know, how much we're mm -hmm. doing and then there are people, I'm a member of Extinction Rebellion, XR. So people are doing different things. And I think all of those, all of those are necessary. Um, 
maybe it's worth mentioning that that's exactly the question that I've been getting a lot. You know, what can I do? What should I do? Yeah. And yeah. what I have been teaching a little bit lately is like a, a three-part bodhisattva meditation or ecosattva contemplation where part one, in other words, no one can tell somebody else what they should do, but how do we find out ourselves? I think we need first to look into ourselves, what do we have to offer? We have to consider our skills, our education, our age, our gender, our, our, our abilities, our health. We have to look at all of those things and see what do we have to offer. Secondly, we need to look outside and see the particular problems because there's so many, we can't do everything, right? We have to choose, um, one or two that we can really focus on. So we need to look at that. And then thirdly though, I think we need to meditate very, very deeply and ask ourselves, ask our true nature, go beyond ego yes. and ask, what does my heart want to do? Where does my heart, where does my love and compassion, how does that want to express itself? And I think that that's the only way each of us can decide you know, what it is that we should do. Really, no one else can tell us. But the other thing that I think is very clear from the kind of problems we're facing now, uh, Bill McKibben, who is an important American um, e you know, ecologist, uh, he was in Paris some time ago for the uh, climate change talks. Somebody asked Bill McKibben, what can I do as an individual? Mm -hmm. And he responded, don't be an individual. <laughs> okay? We have to work together. We cannot yeah. simply think to practice by ourselves or, you know, we have to think how there are many, many things that we can do when we work together that we cannot do if we're by ourselves. So that may be the biggest challenge of all, finding ways to come together and work together. Yeah. Yeah. We are we immediately, we, we found, for example, the Sangha group um, um, could live together in some sense in a piece of land. Hmm. Then why not? Then we can practice together and we can raise the children together. And then we did this. Now we have a school because we need a school, of course. Um, hmm. Why should we, uh, we um, uh, send our children to this school that uh, is made in a kind of mind very um, um, disturbed. Uh, it's a kind of, uh, they, are, they are giving a, a kind of training for our world that uh, is not sustainable. <laughs> not credible. Then we have discourse uh, that lack. Then we, uh, we are defied to find a school. To, to create a school. Then we have the, the teenagers. What to do with the teenagers? <laughs> we have to teach them. And we have, in some sense, help them to, to develop a new kind of world because it's not to get into our world, world. We have to develop a new kind of world. And the same, our spaces for um, retreats, meditation, if we, we can be in some uh, sense without uh, producing garbage, it's good. If we can recycle everything, it's good. If we can product our greens or part of our food, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Then uh, it's in front of us. We, had, we don't have a, a, a big plan, a big uh, planning, but uh, we have to face what is in front of us. Then we start to go. That's it. It's what we are doing. Then we have uh, two schools at the moment and different, about 10 pieces of land in different parts of Brazil Wonderful. for living and uh, meditation. Uh, meditate. I put uh, pressure also for the individual training because everything together, you know, if we are better individuals, we can understand 
non-duality individually, it's better because we can understand it also socially. Then, we, we have the same problem with education here, you know, uh, yes. at all levels, it's, it's more and more simply about job training. Yes, yeah, that's that, university. It's uh -huh. only training for a job. Now, yeah. people need jobs. Yeah. We need income. But yeah. is it simply accepting the present economic order, accepting capitalism, uh -huh. and finding our yeah. place within it? Or don't yeah. we also need to educate ourselves for how we can work to change things and to create mm -hmm. different types of jobs? As you say, yeah. yeah. I think that's really important yes. and challenging. Sometimes I feel we are really constructing another world. Sometimes I feel we have no time. We lost <laughs> because uh, the things go um, so awfully and uh, it's surprisingly uh, so awfully. Then that's it. That. But I think if we do the best we can, it's what we are doing. And uh, we together without planning maybe we can succeed and uh, uh, develop a good uh, time for our children, our grandchildren, and uh, for all living beings, really. Now we can really understand what Buddha said. We have to look for all living beings, yes. We are destroying all living beings. We have to, in some sense, uh, avoid this. I think the Buddha said, or some, maybe it was Zen masters who said, we should practice as if our clothes were on fire. Yes. And the reality, of course, is our world is on fire. And so, you know, the urgency of that should enter into our individual practice. It should help us from being complacent. The, the other Zen teaching that seems so important to me now is don't know mind, you know. We don't really know fully what's happening. We don't know what's possible. We yes. don't know... Yes what's going to come out of it. And of course that applies yeah. to our actions, what we do, but it really applies to everything. I think that there's a fundamental mystery to the world. One of my teachers, Robert Aiken, he liked to say, our path isn't about clearing up the mystery. It's about mm -hmm. making the mystery clear, you know? Mm -hmm. So in Buddhism, when you wake up, it's not as though, oh, now I understand everything. No, it's opening up to this great mystery and being taken by it. Wow. It's not that we grasp it. It's that we, we are expressions of something greater than ourselves. And part of that is this we don't know. And to live yeah. in this don't know mind, especially in a time like now, is, is a really yeah. important part of our challenge, I think. Yeah. Yes. I remember Tokuda-san, he, he, he said, um, the children doesn't hear what you say. The children look your back. <laughs> then do, do, do the better and they will follow. So Then we can teach you by the example, by just by doing, by going. They, they learn from what we do, not what we say. Huh? Yes, that's it. <laughs> it's the point. Then uh, that's it. We're practicing. We don't know everything. We do the, we do the best and we keep walking. <laughs> oh. I, I guess the important thing we agree on, and, and it, it needs to be stressed and repeated, is that the Buddhist path isn't about transcending this world. You know, so many people think yes. this is the world of samsara, suffering, craving, delusion, and the goal is to escape it, to go to some other place, nirvana or, mm -hmm. or the pure land. And that, I think that's a dangerous misunderstanding. The way that I like to express it is in Zen, as we say, the goal is to realize the true nature of this world that our usual way of experiencing the world, it's a social construction. We're seeing it a certain way because we've learned from other people to experience it and understand it. Language is important. And, and so in our practice, what we're basically doing is deconstructing the world, deconstructing our sense of separate self. And, you yeah, know, and 
when it's expressed in that way, we can see it's the same problem collectively. Our task mm -hmm. is to yeah. deconstruct and reconstruct the economic, the political, the social world that we have created together. And that those two paths, you know, those two practices are really interconnected, two parts of the same thing. Yeah. The Tibetans, usually they stress the fact that uh, um, emptiness have to be understood in, uh, in the appearances. Um, emptiness, uh, the, the most profound aspect of emptiness is the, the light it shows mm. because the things are not solid, they are light. Mm. We, we construct with uh, the, the brightness of the mind. And uh, then it's wonderful because the world, the world is open. Everything is open. We can construct all the time. And the things that, that are const already constructed, they are not solid. They are just light, you know. Then we go. That's it. Then um, in uh, any direction we look, we can see the prats. The prats have the, that consciousness, not see that uh, solidity. So. Uh, it, it's solid, but it's not solid. That's it. It's solid, it's solid. solid like the queen and the king and the pines in the chess game. If we're practicing, it's, it looks like solid, you know, but it's not solid, really. Then the world is like that. Then the things are solid, but not that. <laughs> it's wonderful that we can, we, we can have, for example, uh, loss in physics, but uh, in the same way, we can use the computer for playing chess, but we don't. But it's a, a game constructed by the mind. It's not a real thing. <laughs> but we can put the computer. We can find the mathematics of this. The same with the 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 world. We can find the mathematics of this, but it's not solid, really. I, I love to to look, for example, in December. Uh, 20, uh, uh, last year, nobody was seeing the, uh, COVID, you know, uh, nobody was seeing the pandemics. And then everybody have a, a lot of certainties. What would happen in, uh, in this year we are living? <laughs> it's emptiness. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, the reality is like uh, so and I think we lose that emptiness because we grasp at things right we want to hold on to them so we give yeah. that's how we create the illusion of solidity but yes. because they're not really solid there's nothing we can grasp in that way yes. but I think that's the problem with the way that our mind is usually working you know we're, we're trying to ground ourselves by grasping at things and kind of holding on to them Sometimes I talk about our sense of lack, this feeling of insufficiency, which I think is basically it it's, comes from the fact that our sense of self is a construct. It doesn't have any real reality, our sense of separateness. And yes. so we feel that as a sense of lack, as a sense that yes. something is wrong, something is missing, I'm not good enough. And I think we all have this and we try to deal with it by trying to make ourselves feel more real by grasping onto something, maybe money or fame or maybe another person. And none of those things can work because it's still the mind trying to hold on to something, but it can never find the answer in, by doing that. The answer has to do with insight into how the mind works and how it gets stuck by trying to hold on to things that can't be held on to. That the mind is fundamentally empty but because it's empty, it can become anything. It can flow, it can yeah. construct, it can deconstruct, it can play all of these games. But if it gets stuck, if it's identifying with any of them, then, then that's where the dukkha, that's where the suffering and the problems begin. Yeah. It's the, essentially, we are working with uh, dependent origination. Then we took something that's not solid as solid. Then we constructed beyond this point. Then suddenly it cracks and everything falls. <laughs> That's it all the time. <laughs>
It's a good description of our financial system too, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. In these times, the money have not uh, any value other than what we uh, attribute to this. Hmm. It's, it's funny. Money is a social construct, isn't it? It's one of the great... Yes, completely. And yet, and yet we miss that. We, we become so preoccupied with those numbers and those pieces of paper. Yeah. They only have meaning because other people think they have meaning, and yet we become so fixated on them. Yeah. That's it. And once we do that, then we never have enough. If, if money is your lack project, if, if money is the way that you're going to try to fill up your sense of lack, you can never have enough. And uh, yeah. I think that that's the tragedy of that kind of game. I think it's a real problem now because we suddenly or oh, slowly for a long time, we arrived at this point that we have a um, economic reference in everything. We have a, a paradigm, economic paradigm in everything. Everything have value if we can attribute economic value to this. It's so funny because then we see the, see the forests. The forests have no value uh, when it's uh, uh, non-touched. Yeah. It's funny. Then if we cut everything, then uh, the value appear. The, uh, they don't bring any wealth for the people. We cannot see this. Then I think that uh, it's very important if we understand that there are no monetary wealth. Mm -hmm. I think we need to introduce this uh, as a, a social reference. Because, for example, when the people are living like the Indians in the forest, they are very rich because they have, they have water, they have sun, mm -hmm. they have uh, freedom, they have uh, food, they have uh, social uh, stability. Uh, if you have to pay for each of the things, it's very expensive. They have this, but when they are in the board of a big city, they are very poor because they don't have the water, they don't have the social environment, they don't have the other beings, they don't have food, they are poor. And uh, the, uh, the people who is living in the, in the city have to pay a lot, they have to work a lot for the, the things that everybody would have a hundred years ago when they are living countryside, you know but they don't uh, uh, see this. They go to the city, they left, uh, they leave the wealth behind without uh, noticing. Mm -hmm. If you look, for example, the, the, the destruction of nature, we're, distracting, uh, we're uh, destroying the uh, common wealth, the, the wealth of everybody, because the the planet is a is a, a very important thing for everybody, for all all beings, and we are destroying this and converting this to monetary uh, wealth that is for somebody, some poor people, uh, uh, a very small number of persons that uh, have this, and uh, it is escaping their fingers, it uh, disappear for them and uh, make them sick. Yeah, we are living this, you know. Another way to say that is, um, I think we need to, you know, this is part of our social construct that we have to reconstruct. Yeah. And another way to say it is uh, the whole concept of property, the idea of owning yeah. a forest. Yeah. Well, you yes. know, what does that mean? It's really weird yeah. and, and problematical think, sometimes. Yeah. For example, in Brazil yeah. now, we could say some people, some uh, enterprises have all the land in some sense. So they, they own they it, are, it's their property, yeah. And they are using not for the people. They are uh, selling this abroad, like uh, uh, Pau Brasil, like the Brazil started uh, planting sugar and exporting sugar. And the people in Brazil, it doesn't have uh, any meaning, you know or mining gold, mining silver, and sending abroad without uh, any meaning for the people. That's it. They took the land, they took the source of water, 
the sunshine and sell this for themselves. I think we cannot construct a, a country in that way. That will have to be reconstructed. Yes. <laughs> and on, on that note, Sensei Loi Lama Santem, uh, um, we're we're a little over time. Of course, we can keep going. Uh, I, I leave it to you, Lama Santem. Do you want to do you want to ask a final question, or uh, or shall we wrap up now? Well, what do you think? I uh, would ask you, please be bless us, uh, Sensei. Pray for us. <laughs> 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 pray for all of us pray for yes. all of us. yeah i i think the prayer is the times we are in now are the highest test of our practice you know we are you know if we are buddhist practitioners what are we practicing for is it just for our own enlightenment or if we look more deeply this is the greatest possible test of our spiritual maturity. And we always have to ask ourselves, how do we respond appropriately to this challenge? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lama Samden. Thank you, David. I, I would say that uh, we need to uh, learn and contemplate more the teaching of uh, Dogen Zenji. Mm. It's uh, Huineng also. So It's uh, wonderful. Two of the greatest <laughs> Thank teachers. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much both and please join me in thanking uh, for this wonderful conversation if you'd like to with the uh, reaction buttons. I'm going to go for the uh, exploding ice cream cone. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, we're, but, there it is. So thank you both so much. Uh, I would love to uh, just keep listening for hours, but uh, I know that uh, David, you have another appointment uh, in not too long. And uh, so thank you both. And riffing a little off your conversation that now uh, as people who know have been uh, following the SEBI talks, um, we're going to now move to another Zoom, David, which you have the address for the college. And this is SEBI's uh, new attempt, an old dream and uh, putting into some practice now. And there's 10 students from Brazil, 10 students from the US, and who are trying, we're trying to do exactly what you're saying, that the education that's out there just isn't the education which is going to create the direction world we need. So uh, we're ending a little early just to make sure that uh, we, we can give time for the uh, college students. So thank you again. And can I, thank can I mentioned Andreas, uh, uh, for those who want more along the same line, uh, there's a lot of material on my website, davidloy.org, okay. but also uh, the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Retreat Center, which we've started in the mountains above Boulder. So that also has a website. So you could check those out if they want to continue the the investigation. I've heard rumor that you do sashin sitting outside in the mountains for two weeks. Is that true? Uh, I wouldn't call it a sashin, but yeah, because we were closed this summer due to COVID, we did have a 17 day, it was two parts put together, right? We did have a 17 day uh, retreat where everyone was camping outside and only the staff were in the uh, actual uh, lodge. And that worked quite well, despite some rain, some hail. Uh, yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. it's something to consider. Maybe somebody would like to visit us sometime. Yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely. And I, I truly hope that there might be some more chance to uh, make some connections between the Rocky Mountain Eco Dharma Center and some of the things Seb is, yeah. Seb is doing. So uh, hopefully this is the first of many interactions. I hope so. Yes, too. please. Yes, a pleasure. Please. Wonderful. Well, and most importantly, thank you for everyone who's joined us today. And uh, I hope that this has been in, as enjoyable for everyone as it's been for myself. And uh, look for, uh, I think we're looking forward to the next round of SEBI Talks starting in February. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Sensei Loy. Thank you. And, and just a final note, uh, while the next uh, pilot of Sabi Talks will be next year, still this year, in the last days of the year, we have this traditional event, 108 Hours for Peace, that we host here. This year it will be online, so we have several days to discuss the most pressing problems in our time, so everyone is invited to join us in, in the website of Sabi. In a few days, we will have more complete information about that. Yeah.
Yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the translator, too, working really hard. Thank you. <laughs>